Hello and welcome everyone to another Earth Echo International virtual event. My name is Casey and I will be your host today for our STEM Explorer virtual career connection featuring Jasmine Graham. We're so excited to have her back today. Earth Echo International is a nonprofit organization founded on the belief that youth have the power to change our planet. Our programs reach over uh, viewers in over 146 countries, and we're so happy to give resources out there to students and teachers that would like to change the world for the better. Now, this program is part of STEM Explorer, Earth Echo's program to bring relatable voices of STEM careers to light. And we're so excited, like I said, to have Jasmine with us here today as our featured STEM Explorer mentor. And we'd like to thank our program sponsor, Raytheon Technologies, for their support of women in STEM and this program. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If you are uh, joining us in the Zoom Live, you can go ahead and use that Q&A feature to ask your questions of our expert today. If you are joining us on YouTube, welcome. We have a wonderful chat window open just to the right of the viewing screen. Go ahead and use that space for your questions as well. Now, I do want to preface that our, there are a lot of people online learning these days, so please let's be respectful and also please let's be patient. If we experience any technical difficulties, just hang tight and we will be right back. Now, we will break throughout today's program to ask your questions of our expert, Jasmine. So keep those questions coming. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with today's STEM Explore Virtual Career Connection featuring Jasmine Graham. So Jasmine, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? I am wonderful. It's so great to see you again and to have you here on our STEM Explore Virtual Career Connection. Now, just to let everybody know out there, Jasmine and I are both located in Florida where it's very, very hot currently. <laughs> so we hope everybody is staying cool and staying healthy wherever they are. So Jasmine, as we get started, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce your yourself, tell people a little bit more um, about yourself and yeah, what you're doing these days. So hi everyone, it's so great to be here. Um, as Casey mentioned, my name is Jasmine. I am an Elasma rank ecologist. Um, so I study sharks and rays, um, and I study how they move um, and how they interact with their environment. So what I do is called movement ecology, studying how they move, why they move, where they spend a lot of time. And uh, specifically, I study the small tooth sawfish, which is a critically endangered ray species that is found in the U.S. waters. Um, they used to be found all the way as far north on the east coast as at least North Carolina, maybe farther north, um, and then all along the Gulf Coast of the United States uh, as far west as Texas. Um, we also used to have two, two uh, sawfish species, the large tooth sawfish and the small tooth sawfish. Um, unfortunately, the large tooth sawfish died out in U.S. waters. They're still found other places, but in the United States, they no longer exist. Um, and then the small tooth sawfish, sadly, their population size shrank dramatically due to um, commercial fishing and people catching them and using their saws for trophies and things like that. Um, so now there's not, not very many of them and they are found only um, in South Florida mostly. Um, so we have what's called a lifeboat population here in Florida, which means it is um, a major stronghold that's keeping the small tooth sawfish afloat globally. Uh, there are two life, lifeboat populations, the one in Florida, and then there's another one in the Bahamas. Um, but they are really struggling um, in most places. Uh, so I have my little stuffed sawfish here so you can kind of see what one looks like so her name is sammy so they have you can tell that they're rays because they have their mouth and their gills on the bottom sharks have their gills on the sides of their bodies so that's how you can tell that a sawfish is a ray and then this is 
why we call them a sawfish because people look at this and they say this looks like a saw. Um, in science, we call this a rostrum. That's the name for this little part here. Um, but that's what I study. I study the small tooth sawfish movements. Um, in the past, I've done research studying the evolution of hammerhead sharks. I'm really interested in animals that look weird um, is the short, <laughs> long and short of it. I like studying animals that look weird, that seem like they shouldn't exist, but do. Um, so hammerheads that. and sawfish because they have weird heads. That's my thing. That's my jam. Um, <laughs> so I'm really interested in sharks and rays and conservation, but particularly interested in animals that have weird head shapes. That's awesome. And I think one of the, the coolest things that you did point out, which I was hoping people would get from today's talk, is that sawfish are rays. They are not sharks. They are shark relatives, but they are rays. That is so great. Well, thank you for that introduction. So Jasmine, I have a series of questions that will kind of lead our conversation this afternoon. So to start things off, you've already kind of teased this a little bit. Can you tell everyone out there, what do you do for a living? So I do lots of different things um, because I feel that people shouldn't be put in boxes. So I am a scientist. I'm also an educator. I'm also a diversity and inclusion officer and advocate. Um, and I'm all of those things simultaneously. So I do my research. Um, and I, as I mentioned, I study the movements of small tooth sawfish, um, as well as some shark species. And I'm interested in that and understanding the science of that. Um, but I, my science, I want to mean something um, in terms of conservation. So I'm what people sometimes call an applied ecologist. So I go beyond just doing science to how that science directly um, affects policy and what it means in terms of policy. So looking at the small tooth sawfish movements, not just because I wanna know where they are, just to know where they are, but because I think it's important for us to protect areas where they're hanging out because they are a critically endangered species. So I have my science side and I have some pictures here. I've done a lot of cool scientific research. Um, like I mentioned, I studied the hammerhead family and I did um, a study where I was trying to figure out their evolutionary history and their phylogeny, which is basically like a family tree of sharks, so to speak. So which hammerhead is most closely related to which? Um, so a lot of people don't know that, a lot of people think that a hammerhead is just like one type of shark. It's actually an entire family of sharks. There are many species of, uh, that fall into the family of hammerheads. Um, so I studied how those members of this family, of that family is related to each other. And I did this with genetics, uh, so a lot of lab work, but I also looked at their anatomy. Um, and I did a, a different technique uh, than maybe is traditionally used. Instead of doing dissections, I actually CT scanned the sharks. Um, and then I did what's called digital segmentation, which is basically like virtually dissecting a shark. Um, so that's a good way to do things so you don't have to um, actually mess with the sample. So if you have one museum specimen and everyone's using it, you don't want to destroy that specimen because we don't want to go out and take sharks out of the wild unnecessarily. So if we all can use the same specimen to do our things, that's better. So this is a way for me to study it without destroying the specimen so that other people can use it to study as well. So I did a lot of that and so that's my science part. Um, I also do outreach, doing things like this. So I'm a science communicator. It's very important to me. Uh, it's a big part of what I do and why I do it um, because science is great and I want everyone to experience science and be excited about science and I want everyone to see themselves represented in science and so I like to um, talk to groups and things like that. And then I'm a diversity and inclusion officer and advocate. So in my day job, um, when I'm not doing research, I'm actually a project coordinator for a program called Marsai Lace, which is geared towards recruiting, supporting, and retaining minority students in marine science. 
Uh, so I'm very dedicated to doing that. Um, and then I recently formed an organization with three other people um, that's called MISS, Minorities in Shark Science. And that is specifically to support uh, women of color that are interested in shark science. And so we, that is a recently formed organization. We're doing a lot of programs with that uh, to really increase diversity and minority participation in shark science specifically. Uh, so that's kind of what I do. Uh, I do a lot of different things. I <laughs> kind of stand at the intersection of science, diversity, and education. And that's where I live. <laughs> that is awesome. I love it. And I love that your career is so incredibly diverse because we're going to have a lot to talk about today. And in fact, we already have questions coming in. So um, the first question I have is coming from our friends at Primetime Palm Beach County. And Piper wants to know, when you say rays, do you mean stingrays? So stingrays are in the category of rays. So not all rays are stingrays. Um, so it's kind of like the rectangle square thing. Uh, so yes, stingrays are included whenever I say rays, but not all rays are stingrays. So sawfish, for example, are not stingrays. Um, so a stingray is a very specific group of rays that has a defense mechanism where they have a barb on their tail. That's why we call them stingrays, because they sting. Um, but yes, stingrays are included when I say rays, but there are other rays besides stingrays. And I've also heard them uh, referred to as flat sharks. Yes, so <laughs> endearingly referred to as flat sharks uh, because they're like sharks, they're relatives of sharks, they're just flat. <laughs> um, and um, so funny story, um, endearing nickname for the sawfish are danger snoots um, because a snoot, for those of you that are unaware of the terminology that the kids are using these days, um, a snoot is often used with dogs and cats to refer to their nose so you can boop the snoot. Um, so the snoot is a cute way to say nose and danger snoot because they have a giant weapon as a nose. So they're danger snoots. <laughs> that is, I love that term. That's really great. Now this next question also comes from our friends at Primetime Palm Beach County. And I have a feeling it's going to lead us in to a little video clip you have for us. How do you virtually dissect a shark? Are they ah, that alive? Is a Good question. And yes, I do have a video specifically for this. <laughs> so here's the video that kind of it shows what I do. So Jasmine, as we're watching this, I think our audio is okay. Do you want to explain a little bit of what's going on here? Yes. Yeah, so whenever we get these CT scans, everything is just there. So CT scans are made for people. Uh, sharks are not people. Um, so people are made of bones. Um, sharks are made of cartilage. So it's a little hard sometimes for our machines that are made to detect 
bones to be able to um, sense cartilage. And so whenever we first get these, you'll see that a lot of the structures are, you know, meshed together. You can't really see the differences between them. And they, it, honestly, it looks like a polar bear in a snowstorm when we first get it. And uh, so I have to go in and I, you know, studied the anatomy of all these different types of sharks. I know what these structures are supposed to look like. I'm very familiar in how to look and see the little indentations that show the separation between structures. And so I go in and I basically remove all of the structures that aren't the specific structure that I'm looking for. And so I separate it out from all of that other noise and mess. Okay. Um, and I do that for every single structure. Um, so in that video, I was doing it with the, what's called the hyomandibular, which is part of a, the jaw. Uh, so I have to go through and I have to do it. It takes, uh, it kind of varies on how long it takes. Some scans are easier and more clear than others. This is a pretty clear scan. So just looking at it, you can kind of see where the different structures meet each other. Um, so this was a pretty easy one to do. Um, and then certain parts of the body are easier than others. So you can kind of see partially some of the gills here and you can see they're a little smushed. Um, so it's really hard to do the gills. <laughs> that takes a little bit longer. This structure, the hyomandibular is actually pretty easy um, to separate out uh, because it's a lot more dense than all of the other cartilage around it. So it's pretty easy to see what's happening. Um, so this process can take anywhere from, I would say the fastest I've segmented a shark would be six or seven hours. Um, and some of them take, uh, multiple days for me to do. Um, so I don't know, maybe 24 hours if you add it all up. Um, so some of them are more difficult than others, but at the end of it, I have these beautiful, skeletal um, diagrams. Um, so this is on the left, you have the outside. So what it looks like with the skin on it. Um, and this is a wing headed shark, uh, which is a member of the hammerhead family. Its scientific name is Uspira blocki, if you are curious. And then on the right side, we have the skeleton of the wing headed shark. And in the middle, I have another example um, so this is a, a bonnet head here. Um, and so the bonnet heads are my favorite type of shark. So I just threw it in there because it's cute. <laughs> <laughs> it. And, uh, Jasmine, London asks, are sawfish considered to be elasmobranchs? Yes, sawfish are elasmobranchs. So, um, the term elasmobranch, the words mean strapped gills. So, it is a group of organisms uh, that have a specific type of gill structure. Um, so sharks and rays fall into that category of elasmobranch. And then uh, they're also chondrichthian. So, you know, it's kind of like a, the, the rectangle square thing. So there's a big overarching category of elasmobranchs where sharks and rays fall into that in addition to some other groups of animals. And if you wanna get down uh, deeper, they're also chondrichthians because they're made of cartilage. There are other animals that are made of cartilage um, like chimeras, um, but they are, they fit into both of those categories. They are elasmobranchs and they are chondrichthians. So they have the strapped gill and they're made of cartilage. So they, these things are kind of just ways that scientists describe and group animals based on some certain characteristics. Excellent. And we have uh, another question coming in, and this is going to lead right into um, your next slide, which is very serendipitous. So um, let's see, Courtney asked, when you worked with sharks for the first time, how did you feel? Were you scared? I was not scared. I was really excited. Um, <laughs> so the very first shark that I handled was a fine tooth shark. And um, I just remember it came out of the gill net. We were pulling the gill net out of the water and I was like, oh, 
it's a shark. It's my first shark. And this is when I was in college and I was very excited. And of course I wanted to take all the pictures with it. And um, my, the person that I was out on the boat with, he had already explained how to handle the shark, how to do it safely um, and all of that. So I obviously have a healthy respect. I'm not going to go stick in my hand in its mouth because <laughs> that's not wise, uh, especially with fine tooth. Their teeth are very sharp. They hurt. Um, and so I was aware of what I was doing. Everyone on the boat was making sure that all of the safety precautions were taken and I knew how to hold it. And so it was safe for the shark and safe for me. Um, so I wasn't really concerned. I've actually never been concerned um, handling sharks um, where everyone on the boat is very well trained. There are if it's a big shark that takes multiple people, there are multiple people on the sharks and you trust the person that has the bitey end and the person that has the bitey end, trust the person that has the tail end. Um, and so you're like, okay, we're good. It's safe, we're good. Um, so we're very careful that we aren't hurting the sharks and obviously that we aren't getting hurt. Um, so I've always felt very safe handling sharks. Um, the biggest challenges with doing field work are usually related to boats. I'm more concerned about my engine stopping randomly when I'm out in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> That's great. And that was actually a question that Andrea had asked is what became one of your biggest challenges. So that's always interesting um, that it's that it's usually, you know, equipment wise of yeah. things. So let's move on and talk a little bit more about some of that research that got you started in this field, Jasmine. Um, I know you've provided us with a lot of really cool pictures of some things that you've done in the past. Yes, yeah, so I, I am a shark and ray specialist, but before I decided to specialize, I tried a bunch of different things to see how I liked it. Um, so this is actually a picture of a project that I did that I worked on as an undergraduate student, and this was on coastal acidification. So a lot of people have heard of ocean acidification, where excess CO2 in the environment um, is lowering the pH of the oceans because oceans are natural sequesters of carbon. Um, so they're taking in a lot of carbon dioxide, so much so that it's actually changing the chemistry of the ocean. Um, and so that's very interesting out in the open ocean, but it's particularly interesting on the coast because the coastal water has a lot of influences. So its chemistry is constantly changing anyway, and it fluctuates naturally. So what happens if you exaggerate those natural fluctuations um, because it's doing all of this extra work to deal with the extra carbon dioxide that's in the environment? Uh, so that's what I was studying. And I was out at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. We had this really cool contraption that the principal investigator in that lab uh, created. Um, it was very... Uh, interesting and we were constantly working on it and fixing it. Uh, this was a, one of their first prototypes uh, that was four years ago so I'm sure they have a much nicer version now. Um, but working there I definitely learned a lot of um, electrical wiring and plumbing and a lot of other things that I need to do on the fly whenever uh, our equipment went down. <laughs> now so, I'm a jack of all trades. <laughs> Excellent. And then of course we are working in the Chesapeake Bay, which is a very fertile place. Uh, there are lots of things living in the Chesapeake Bay, which is great if you're something that needs to eat things. Uh, it's not so great if you're trying to keep your equipment clean. Uh, so we would put our equipment in the water and leave it for a week. And this is what it would look like after a week. There would be so many organisms growing on it that the pump would stop working because there were bryozoans and there, there were all kinds of things that just decided that they wanted to make their home on our equipment. We're, we're like, okay, not here, somewhere else. Can you grow somewhere else, please? So I would have to go and physically scrape all of these animals off back into the water and be like, go settle somewhere else. Please don't live <laughs> on my equipment. <laughs> That's great. And then we looked at um, plankton and counting the plankton. Uh, so uh, that's a picture of what the water looks like in 
Chesapeake Bay. Um, just lots of uh, things, like I said, very fertile. Uh, lots of things living in there. All of these little things you see here um, are uh, little tiny microscopic little animals <laughs> that live in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and then of course I was doing a lot of chemistry to figure out what the pH and alkalinity and things like that uh, were in the water. And so I actually learned how to use this really fancy system, uh, which is a titration system. Uh, so whenever I was in college, we had a very rudimentary version of this where you just had to like open a little valve and just watch drops of acid go into your thing. And just when it changed to the right color, you had to turn it off real quick so you didn't go past that point. Um, but this is all automated and you can set up 20 samples and it just automatically does it. It puts a little pH probe in there and it knows exactly when it needs to stop and then it just stops. And wow. it's great. <laughs> That's amazing. Technology has Technology. made some really great advancements. Yes, <laughs> and we do have a comment. Um, the YouTube chat is just commenting as you're talking. And Yasmin said um, that with the organisms that would settle on your equipment must be frustrating, but also fascinating to see all those different organisms. Very fascinating. Lots of <laughs> tiny crabs and snails just hanging out there. <laughs> and uh, um, this next slide actually brings me to a great question we had earlier on from our friend Miranda. She's with C School Preschool. And she wants to know if you can give a rough number of the US small tooth sawfish populations. I cannot give a rough number. Um, so we don't know a lot. Uh, part of my research is contributing to that information. Um, so there have been some papers that have been put out that you know have ranges of numbers, but no one's actually sure. Um, so what Matt, so some papers say like a thousand mating pairs or something like that but that you know it's a lot of numbers where we're just like we've caught a hundred and we're gonna guess that we've caught this percent of the population and we're just totally just throwing numbers out there so we don't actually know this is all just a bunch of mathematicians playing with numbers trying to guess um but yeah we don't know <laughs> And so then you you got your start into the sawfish research, correct? Do you yes. want to speak anything else a little bit more about that here? Yes. So I started doing sawfish. Um, and uh, before I had started this, I don't know that I had ever seen a sawfish. I don't even know that I had seen one in an aquarium. I don't think. Maybe if I did, and I don't remember it. Um, but I started doing this project. And like I said, cool, weird looking animals. I was like, boom, this is a weird looking animal. Checks off all of my boxes. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I'm going to study it. Um, and so I started doing this project uh, that was funded by the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Program. Um, and we started fishing. Well, they, my lab that I worked in had already been fishing for sawfish. Um, so they kind of had the methodology down, um, which is why I felt more comfortable deciding to do my master's thesis on an endangered species uh, for people watching that are maybe undergrads. Um, yeah, choosing an endangered species to do your project on is a definitive choice. <laughs> like you are putting all your eggs in a needle in a haystack. <laughs> um, so I was like, okay, you seem like you might be able to find enough sawfish for me to do a project off of it. So thankfully that was the case. We caught a lot of sawfish, um, got a lot of tags out. And then I used a really cool organization, several really cool organizations that are actually partnerships of a lot of different scientists where we all deploy all of these receivers that are basically like little stations that we can, uh, whenever our fish swim past, we know where they are. Um, and so everyone volunteers to be part of these networks where they share data. So you have your things out there. Obviously they don't just hear your fish, they hear all everyone's fish. So whenever someone's fish goes by and you're like, oh, that's not my fish, but I don't know whose fish that is, 
you can actually share that data to this um, public space and people can go in and get data and say, oh, my fish was detected on this person's receiver. That's cool. Um, so I was able to get really nice coverage of where my sawfish were moving all along the coast of Florida, thanks to all of these scientists that volunteer to be part of this network and share that data. So um, this project was um, definitely not all me. It was a very collaborative effort and um, it took a lot of people to do this project. So um, it was a really cool experience. I got a lot of networking and I got to hang out with these incredible animals that are just, as you can see, ginormous, 16 feet long um, uh, is how big they get as adults. Um, so these are just marvelous creatures that a lot of people don't get to see. And I got to see a bunch of them. So I'm very grateful for that. That is awesome. And um... Collaboration is key, um, especially in scientific research. So it's so great um, that you had that project to work on. And your newest endeavor has a lot of collaboration, as I understand. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about Minorities and Shark Sciences? Yes. So MIS is a new organization uh, we just formed. Um, as I mentioned, we are looking to promote women of color and shark science. So we have a workshop that we're doing uh, with the field school in Miami, Florida. And we are going to be taking um, students. So these are students that are interested in doing research in shark science. Um, and we are going to give them the opportunity to come out. Um, this is specifically for people that have the interest really excited about it. And for whatever reason, they have not ever been able to get research or field experience working with sharks. And so we um, are fundraising uh, to be able to pay for all of these individuals, all of these women of color to be able to come on the boat um, and have this experience, all expenses paid because finances are a huge barrier for a lot of people interest, interesting, interested in shark science because it is very expensive. Um, so boat time, things like that. So there's a lot of unpaid internship opportunities. A lot of things rely on you to have the ability to volunteer. Um, and so we are trying to create a space where people don't have those barriers um, so they can go and it's not gonna cost them anything. They can get the experience. They can meet other people um, interested in the same things as them. They can network with each other. We can create this support system um, and really just create a space where women of color feel welcome and supported and have access to resources and things like that and get the confidence um, to pursue shark science and feel like it's something that's for them because science is for everyone. Um, and it's really important to me that everyone feels like science is for everyone and that they have a place in science. And so we've created this space to make sure that they feel like they have a place and get them connected with people um, so that they can continue on and become great shark scientists because we need all of the shark scientists we can get. We need all of the perspectives and experiences that we can get. There are a lot of issues and concerns with shark conservation that we can only answer um, with innovation. And to have innovation, we need diversity of thought, which means we need diversity of people. We need people from different backgrounds. It can't just be all one type of person from one uh, racial, cultural group, from one gender, from one um, social class. Uh, we really need everyone at the table to be able to handle a lot of these issues that sharks um, are facing. And so it's very important to me. Uh, and we're really excited for this opportunity. And um, if anyone is interested in finding out more about MISS, you can go to missalasmo.org um, and um, check that out. Uh, we'll be updating on what kind of programs we'll be doing. You can join our mailing list um, and we will be sending out updates of all the exciting programs we're doing. We're starting with this workshop, but that is not the end. We're hoping to do some K through 12 outreach programs. We're hoping to eventually have a conference where 
people are sharing their research, lots of big things happening. So definitely, if you are interested in finding out more about that, um, visit our website. And we are also four that only $4,000 short of our goal of $25,000. We have raised $21,000 so far. Um, so if you feel so inclined to contribute, we are also taking donations, shameless plug. <laughs> I love it. That is perfect. This is the opportunity to put that shameless plug out there. So that is truly incredible. And here at Earth Echo, we are so incredibly excited to hear about MISS and the opportunities that you all want to provide. Um, you, along with some other STEM Explore mentors, are the founders of MISS. So we're so excited to be able to support this and, and help you all in any way that we possibly can. So we're so happy about it. Um, so Jasmine, we're, we're running close on time here, but I do want to ask the question, what inspired you to do this work? Um, lots of things inspired me. Um, my love of the ocean inspired a lot of it. Um, I have always loved being on boats. I've always been interested in science. Um, and then I've always been interested in giving back. So my purpose in life uh, is to leave the world better than I found it. Um, and I do that in all of these things. So I think that education is a way to leave the world better than you found it, transmitting information. Um, conservation is definitely a way to leave the world better than you found it. Um, and then diversity and inclusion efforts, social justice is a way to leave the earth better than you found it. So that's really my inspiration for everything. Whenever I leave this earth, I want there to be some sort of impact that I made that was positive. Well, I think it's safe to say you're doing that <laughs> in many different facets. It's truly incredible to hear your story. And Jasmine, can you remind us, where did you grow up? Were you near water? I grew up um, in Columbia, South Carolina, um, about two hours from Myrtle Beach, which is where my dad is from. Spent a lot of time in Myrtle Beach. Um, I moved around a lot as a child. We weren't always near water, um, but my dad is an avid fisherman. So he always found somewhere, even if it was some little pond to go <laughs> fishing. And he took me along with him. <laughs> Great. Now, just one more question. Um, well, actually I have two more questions for you. So can you uh, speak about any hardships that you've had to overcome and maybe how you did that? Uh, so a lot of my hardships were, I would say, not knowing what to do. Um, so I come from a family, like I mentioned, my dad loves fishing. He, he loves the ocean, but not, he wasn't familiar with science. Um, I don't have any scientists in my family. My, my mother is a nurse. My dad is a, um, private investigator. Um, they, and they just kind of grew up in a, in a time when people like me, black people didn't have access to a lot of things. And so, um, they wanted to help me and support me, but they didn't, they just didn't know uh, a lot of things. Um, and so things like applying for scholarships and how to apply for college and what is an REU, a research experience for undergrad, how do you get into science? Those are things that they couldn't help me with. Um, and even at a young age, I very quickly got past the point where my parents could help me with school. Um, so I remember in the sixth grade was the first time that my parents said, I don't know this. I can't help you anymore. Um, so getting going past a point where my parents were able to help me um, was was challenging and I know growing up there were a lot of people in my classes and stuff that had parents that um, were uh, you know scientists or at least like studied science or something in college and things like that and math and stuff like that um, but having um, having that be something where I was like well I can't ask my parents to help me with my homework who, who, who's gonna help me with my homework um, was challenging. Um, but I got really used to asking teachers for help. Um, when I was in middle school and struggling with math, I spent a lot of time in my teacher's offices 
basically having them reteach me again <laughs> because I didn't get it the first time. Um, and that continued on when I was in college. Um, so fun fact, I am a scientist, but I'm not naturally good at math. But I am naturally not very good at math. <laughs> I had to work really hard. Um, and any time that math came up in my science classes, it was a struggle. And I had to spend a lot of time in office hours and getting extra help. Um, so that's like, that's been my biggest challenge. Um, and then just knowing how to do internships, how to apply for stuff that was, I depended a lot on my professors, um, because I didn't have that experience, um, in my family. So I am really grateful for all the mentors that saw that I was struggling and I didn't know what I was doing. I knew where I wanted to go, but I didn't know how to get there. Um, and they scooped me up and they're like, here's what you do. You apply for research experience and then you do this and then you do this and then you do this and you'll get there. Um, so I've had a lot of people along the way kind of be like, you look like you don't know what you're doing. Let me help you out, um, which I'm really <laughs> grateful for. <laughs> I think that's a really good um, life lesson to keep in mind, not only for young people, but for adults as well. And I know I struggle with this, but do not be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, so I think that's really important. Thank you for sharing that. So one, one last question I have for you to kind of wrap things up, and this is a perfect on the heels of this, is what advice would you give to students out there? Um, I would say ask for help um, and be confident in yourself. Um, so a lot of people, think I'm just a kid or I'm just a college student or I'm just this. And my advice is take just out of your vocabulary. You are a whole person. You have value no matter what stage you are at, no matter how old you are. Um, a lot of times people ask me, what does it mean to be a scientist? what is that? When are you a scientist? Is it when you have a PhD? Is it when you've published a paper? What, when is it when, when are you a scientist? And I always tell them you're a scientist when you see something, you ask a question about it and you investigate it. That is when you're a scientist. You can be a scientist at eight. If you ask yourself, where are the ants going? And you follow them to see where they're going. You did science. You went through the scientific method. You made an observation. You had a question. You had a hypothesis. You carried out the experiment and you got an answer. That is science. Um, and I think that a lot of times whenever we don't ask questions, it's because we're afraid of looking dumb. We're afraid of look, looking like we don't know what we're doing. We're afraid of um, exposing ourselves, right? Of oh, I'm just a kid. And so I don't know. So I don't want to ask, but you absolutely should ask. And if you're an adult and you're watching this and a child asks you a question and you don't know, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. <laughs> uh, the, the thing that gets me is whenever we as adults want to pretend like we have it all together. Um, and admitting that you don't have it all together is going to make children and teenagers and young adults feel much more confident. The moment that I realized that all of these people that I saw as scientists also didn't have it all together and they were also winging it, I was like, oh, cool, I'm not the only one. Um, but newsflash, we're all winging it. Scientists are all asking questions. We don't know what we're doing. We're just going for it. Um, so don't feel like we are better than you or above you. We're all doing the same thing. We're all just going through life, having questions, trying to answer them. We don't have all the answers. Um, and that's why we need you. You might have the answer. Um, I might not have the answer. Just because I did school and I have a degree in science doesn't mean that there is a question that I can't answer that you can. So um, just, just know that you're in this space and you have value and don't be afraid to ask questions and know that sometimes you might have answers that other people don't. That is, wow, Jasmine, 
Yes, yes to all of that. Um, we're getting a lot of applause virtually. We're getting a lot of amen. We're getting a lot of yes, and I love that. So that was so beautifully put. Thank you so much for that. So um, Jasmine, I just wanna say, I'm actually, we might have one more question. Yep, we have one more question uh, from Piper with Primetime Palm Beach County. We want to know what is the best thing you like about your job? Spending time on the water, hands down. I love the ocean, it's my happy place. Um, I actually feel sad whenever I haven't seen the ocean in a while. Um, and so, yeah, being able to be out on the water and have that be part of my job is the best thing. <laughs> Awesome. That's great. And again, Jasmine, we can't thank you enough for taking the time to share your story with us and with everybody tuning in out there. You are such an incredible role model and mentor for young people and adults. Um, you're you're doing it. You are doing all the things that you've set your mind to. And we're so excited to be able to, to give you this platform to share more of your story. And um, speaking of platforms, of course, everyone out there, you can stay connected with Jasmine. Here are some social media handles that she provided as well as some websites. So Jasmine, do you have any other parting words of wisdom for anyone out there? I do not, but I hope that, um, I've created some uh, future shark scientists out there. <laughs> I think you might have. I think you might have. Um, this has just been so wonderful. Thank you. And again, we did have um, the information for Miss up online when Jasmine was talking about that. So here you can find all um, the ways you can connect with Minorities in Shark Science, brand new organization. And like Jasmine said, they are looking for some help for some donations so that they can give these opportunities for other young people out there looking to get into this field. And we're so excited um, to see this get off the ground and to, to watch your fins swim. So we can't wait. Thanks. And of course, you can stay connected with us here at Earth Echo on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. If you are here on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button before you go today. And you can uh, check out all of our programs at earthecho.org. So on behalf of Earth Echo International, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you again to Jasmine and everyone. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep exploring. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>